let's continue. Uh, we were taking, talking about these classical algorithms, right? So as I mentioned, um, the cost of you know, uh, passing the test, this cross-entropy test uh, classically, is pretty much the cost um, that it takes to, uh, to compute one of these. Well, it is like, uh, because the, in the challenge there is also this K samples, right? So the cost grows linearly in K, of course, right? Because you have to output K bit strings but times pretty much the cost of computing one particular transition probability, okay? Um, that's also the cost of verification, right? Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more, actually. Once you have noise, there is, a sub, there is something else you can do to lower the cost of actually solving the problem classically. But for the moment, if in the ideal case, it would be pretty much like the cost of k times the cost of computing one transition prob probability. So what is this cost? So this is also right to pretty, you know, it's a pretty general problem, right? So we just want to understand how to compute transition probabilities of some quantum evolution classically, right? People work on that for, for decades. Um, and then, of course, you know, we can also consider time evolution of some time-independent Hamiltonian. There are other methods, right? But here, for circuits, there are two methods, which, which are the best. Uh, one is using some tensor network uh, contraction. You can, you know, each of these gates, you can see this as like a tensor, right, with, uh, with like four legs, right, from the two qubits input to qubits output. Then you start like, you have this huge uh, network of, right, of, of all one gate applied to the other and so on, and you start contracting this tensor network. Uh, this is one method. There's another one which is kind of called Feynman Schrodinger that I, I won't explain, but uh, is also used. But, but the point is that both have the same complexity, okay? So, so there is, uh, the time it takes really, there are two regimes. So if the depth, is sufficiently large, then it's kind of what it expects, right? It's like a very natural thing. So then you really have to store the whole wave function, right? So you just store uh, uh, two to the n parameters, uh, which will take, uh, and, and, then, and then you just, each gate you have, you multiply uh, the gates by the state vector, and how long it takes, takes time, right, roughly linear in the, in the state vector, right? Because this unitary is very sparse, right? So it takes time linear in the size of the state vector two to the n, you have n times d circuit uh, gates that you apply, where x is n by d over 2, right? So, so you know, it scales like this. So this is the case when the depth is sufficiently big. When the depth is not that big, then there is something clever, more clever you can do uh, using this tensor network idea. I, I won't really be able to explain you why that's the case, but uh, you sh should trust me. And then it scales like this, 2 to the power of depth. This is for a square lattice, okay, where each size of the square lattice has square root of n qubits. If you have like a rectangular lattice, then you should replace the square root of n by the smallest of the two dimensions, okay? And more generally, if you know the tensor networks, is explanation the tree width of your contraction, actually. But if you don't know this, don't worry. It is not important. So, so for this particular case that we consider square lattice, it goes like two to the depth times square root of number of qubits divided by two, okay? So one remark, just in case um, uh, there's a subtle point here, this is indeed the scaling. If the two qubit gates that you choose, they are like generic in the sense, uh, meaning if you, if you pick them from the hard measure, they always satisfy this. Pretty much almost any two qubit gate satisfies this. Uh, but this means that they, uh, this, you know, you, you can see them as, as some operator in a bipartite space. You can do the Schmidt decomposition there, and we would like them to be full rank in the Schmidt decomposition, have rank four. So the I swap gate, which is interesting for superconducting qubits because it can be applied there. Uh, like uh, naturally, it has this Schmidt rank four, so that's the scaling for it. But if you have a control Z gate, which is also a natural gate in superconducting qubits, actually it has Schmidt rank only two. So then the simulation is is way way faster, is square root faster actually. Okay, and that's important. So you know if you you want to reach supremacy, you should actually try to implement some I swap. It's like you know, it's much is you can tolerate twice the error rate that you can tolerate for CC. So, so that's just one remark. Um, okay, another remark, and, and that um, is that suppose that you, you have noise now, and we assume this noise model as before, again, right? Uh, just, oops. And um, then actually you can solve, uh, I, I mentioned before, right, that the, the, the classical cost then will be roughly this thing times k but that's for the perfect, uh, when they have no noise. When you have noise, actually you can save some time because you can do some, some th the following simple trick. So you can just sample a coin with uh, bias coin with probabilities f and one minus f. Uh, if you get the outcome associated to f, then 
you just sample from p of x by brute force by computing these transition probabilities and doing the procedure, right? Which takes times this function. Uh, but if you get one minus f, you can simply just you know, sample, you know, uniformly from n bits, right? So this means actually that with noise, uh, the classical simulation cost goes as this function times k times f. Okay, so you have a linear, a, a linear reduction uh, in the classical complexity of solving this problem uh, with fidelity. So the lower the fidelity, the easier it is for you to solve this problem classically. Why do you care about uh, the noise between the classes? Well, because. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah. No, no, you, you, yeah, you're right. So I, I didn't explain this properly. So, but, but you know, the point is that, again, so uh, we, we want to solve this problem with particular epsilon here, right? And the epsilon that you have to choose is basically this fidelity that you have in the quantum experiment, right? So when you want to solve it classically, you are happy to solve the problem with the same f, with the same f, right? With the same epsilon, sorry. You should solve class with the same epsilon. And now I'm saying that doing this trick and choosing f equal to the epsilon you're given does the job, right? But because epsilon equals to f, right? So you know the the lower the fidelity in the experiment, then the, the faster you can solve this class as well, right? And it's, it's a linear factor in f. And and no, soon we are going to try to justify what this linear factor in f. Yeah, I forgot to put it, but it should be there. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, indeed, there should be a k here, right? Yeah. Yeah, this will be the cost for one sample, but you need k, right? So. You have to put it there. Uh, what, what do you mean? No, it's also for passing the test. So because um, because as I said, the, the best way we know how to actually output these bit strings which would pass the test is by doing this rejection sampling where you have to compute this transition probability. So. So actually, the cost, OK, maybe it's like 10 times this, or 5 times this, because there is a little bit of cost for doing this rejection sampling. But because it's Porter Thomas, it's very cheap. It's like from 5 to 10, it varies. So it's between 5 and 10 times this number. That's the, that's the cost to actually pass the test. So, but that, that's a good question. Let's compare now with the cost of verifying, right, that you actually pass the test. Then for the verification, you do not gain anything in terms of f, right? Uh, we don't have this factor of 10 that I forgot to put. So the, so the cost to verify is indeed k times this thing, right? Because you have to compute k times this transition probability, whereas the cost to pass the test is again k times this function, but now times f. So, so the cost of passing the test is, uh, f, is f times the cost of verifying, okay? So it's always harder to verify than to, to, to fake it classically. And, and this, uh, yes, there's a question. So, um, F would be one of the k squares. Well, actually, it's, it's the other way around. Right? We have to choose k as a function of the F we can achieve, right? But, yeah. So, k grows, if k is to, um, you get one of the f squares, and you can't get the one of the f squares. Correct, but um, um, that's. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's a bit subtle because f depends on all these parameters too, right? So actually, you know, if you fix new and you start increasing n and d, then actually at some point this just grows to this is bad, right? Because it's a fight between what appears in the f and what you have here, right? Uh, well, actually, wait, wait. Let, let me see again what you're saying. So you're saying uh, k is one of f square, so you have this thing divided by f, right? Um, and then you're saying the lower um, yeah, I mean, it's true that the lower the f, the, the bigger the cost, but that's simply because, you, you know, you want to put more and more strings, right? So, which, which you know, you pay the same price in the quantum experiment, right? The quantum experiment, what is the runtime? Is the time it takes for one sample, which for superconducts in qubits is something like, you know, n uh, 100, uh, 100 nanoseconds, right? Or w well, maybe like a few mi microseconds, uh, times k, right? So both are, both are increasing with k, right? So that's why we shouldn't think about k. k is a fact that is in both of them, right? So if you look at the ratio of the two running times, k doesn't appear there. Right? Um, is that clear, or is there another question? Okay, so, so good. This is like, 
you know, it's nice you have you can have expression, right? And there's no like hidden constants and so on, so it, it's nice. It's really the, the thing. But of course, once you try to implement that on some computer, right? Implementation matters, and how you do it, and everything matters, right? It's like a HPC question, or it's a high-performance computing question, of, right? And many people tried that, and they did great work. I think it's uh, uh, they're very well done. Then you know, people at Google, but also at Alibaba, at NASA, at Michigan State, and you see from time to time a paper coming out where they implement really well one of these two methods, Tensor Network or this Feynman Schrodinger. They optimize everything as much as they can in the code, and then they have a new like record, you know, on, on the number of qubits and on the depth that they can simulate, right, some random circuits. So this became like a game of having better and better simulators for quantum circuits, which I think is interesting anyway, right, because you want to have this code to run all this stuff, right, and, and understand better, you know, quantum algorithms or quantum mechanics. So, so one of the one result that I want to mention for you to see what it can be achieved uh, by people from, well, the first offer is actually from uh, uh, Irvine and Champagne, and there's people from Google, and there's people from NASA. What they did is they used this tensor network method, and I just want to tell you a little bit in pictures what it does, but you know, in no level of detail. So as I said, right, so you have the two-dimensional circuit here, right, the qubits, and then there's another dimension, which is, which is time, right? And you can see the whole thing as actually a three-dimensional tensor network that you want to contract, right? If you do, as I said, each two qubit gate, you just think as, as like a tensor with four legs, right? Two legs from the qubits that are coming in and two legs from the qubits that are coming out. And then you just, right, connect all of them by the order you're doing the circuit, and this defines this three-dimensional tensor network. In this paper, they, they contracted that. There is many ways to contract the tensor network, and, and, the, and the order that you contract matters. They contract first in time, so they contract in time, and they get two-dimensional tensor network. And then they use some heuristic to try to find a, a good like, contraction path, which minimizes you know, the, the running time. And um, I don't want to tell more than that, but you can read the paper. Uh, and as far as you know, that's the best thing we can do, right? Although you know, someone maybe can come up with a better a contraction scheme, or maybe some approximate contraction scheme. These things are possible, but people have tried. Uh, you know, many different people have tried, and it kind of looks, looks right. Uh, so what is the cost of these methods if you want to compute these bit strings that pass the cross entropy? And when k is like 10 to the minus 6, that's one you know, possible number for the number of samples that people might want to do in the experiments. And if epsilon is like 5 times 10 to the minus 3, which is also, you know, these numbers from this paper, right? So these are numbers that we expect will be realistic for the experiments. Right? Uh, so QPU is just the quantum processing unit. This just means the time that the quantum computer takes, right? So people like to call it QPU sometimes. And we assume that that's the sampling rate, OK? So 10 kilohertz. That's like how many bit strings we can get per second. Uh, we, can get, uh, we can get 10 to the 4, right, different ones per second running the quantum experiment, uh, right? Which is, right, it takes like 10 to the minus 4 to get uh, one sample. OK, so, so that's a circuit that you know, is a little bit smaller than uh, like people now. You know, they were shooting for 52, 53, right? This is like 49. Uh, the depth is 42, uh, but this is using control Z gates, okay? So remember, control Z gates, they are, in the end, people realize they're not the best gates because they gen don't generate a lot of, as much as entanglement as they could. So if you put a more powerful gate like iSwap or just some generic to qubit gates from the Hall measure, the same result will work with depth 20, okay? So maybe you should have 20 here in mind. That's just because that's what the paper did. Suppose you want to target fidelity 0.5%, okay? So this, this thing, like it's 5 times 10 to the minus 3. Then they, they benchmark how much it would take for NASA supercomputer lecture. It would take 59 hours. How much it would take in the summit supercomputer, one of the most powerful, would take uh, two and a half hours. And how much it would take on the quantum computer would take 0.02 hours. Okay? So you're already seeing some big separation between right, the quantum and the classical. You can boost the separation if you want just like you know, each qubit that you add, right, you separate almost by a factor uh, of of, um, well, it's a little bit hard to say because they're not, right, the fidelity goes down and, and the, the cost grows, but it kind of growing exponentially with the qubits, right, up to some threshold because the error rate is fixed and then it doesn't anymore. But, you know, it's kind of the exponential growth. So if you, once you go to 49 to, to 53, you can have much bigger numbers. If you increase the depth from 20 to something more, you can have even bigger, right? And these are games you can do. But, you know, this is also, uh, is maybe what you should for is, is in this range, 
because here you can still certify, right? Now you can just uh, you know, use the supercomputer to verify you're doing the right thing, and it's still feasible, right? This is the time to fake, right? Because the fidelity is low, you take you know, uh, longer, you take like, uh, I mean, even here it's already a big challenge to verify with this fidelity, right? Because it's 200 times, it will be like 400 hours to verify. But it's still possible, right? It takes like 10 days to verify, okay? So with this number, you have a big gap between quantum and classical. Verification takes like 10 days, but it can be done. So you know this, for me, this is like good enough to say that there's some quantum supremacy, right? There is like this very big separation already of quantum and classical. Okay, um, good. Any questions on this slide? Yes. Uh, yes, this is the, uh, this, you mean, it, it takes the, the class computer to, sorry? That's right, that's right, meaning that uh, if, you, if you, the only thing that you have to change in this table is put 20 here, and then all the rest is the same. <coughs> yep. Yes. That's right, so the, the, the numbers here are a little bit worse, uh, and that's because this 0.5% to keep it error rate, I just made it up, is around that, but it's, you know, now, once you put error measurements and error measurements in superconducts and qubits, actually, at the moment, they are worse than 0.5%, right? And, uh, no, that one was 0. That, that, one, that number that I put, if you only had these errors to qubit gate errors and measurements were perfect, uh, and preparation was perfect, it would be 8%, right? Yeah. So, uh, but you know, actually, in this, you know, future experiments, right, they will come, there are measurements, they are pretty noisy, actually, and then it's, Maybe be more in this range, you know. Better, yeah. Um, okay, so so one important question is, how sure we are that this, this is the best thing you can do, right? That there is not, you know, a better way of of solving this problem. And you know, last year I spent big part of the year thinking about that, right? Trying to come up with a better method to do it, um, because that's important, right? If you want to claim supremacy, and in general. Uh, we still don't know, so this, this seems to be right for this kind of depth that people are planning to run. But actually, uh, with, with some collaborators, I'm going to mention their names now, we, we could break in one, uh, in, in the region of very, of very low depth. So we have to be a bit careful about that. So I want to mention that because it's kind of interesting. So this is work with, work with people at MIT, uh, uh, John Epp, Roland De Placa, uh, and Aaron Harrow, and with my student Alex Dalzell. We will post it soon. So. Um, so it's a better simulation method for very, uh, for random short depth circuits. Uh, so I said in the beginning, right, we always assume that these random circuits are the hardest to simulate, right? Because they have no structure, right? And indeed that makes some sense. But actually, what we saw is that if you consider short depth, and short depth is like in depth three, four, maybe five works, but there is some transition that I will discuss. Uh, then actually these random circuits, they are much easier to sample than the worst case of a circuit, okay? So, so actually there is something interesting that happens that there is some hidden structure that you can use to simulate them better. Uh, and for example, just practically speaking, uh, in terms of like what we could achieve, if you have 120 by 120 lattice, right? So other, other like 10 to the four qubits, is that right? Yeah, like uh, a lot of qubits. Uh, but now instead of the depth into n, the depth is just three. But note that for the worst case over circuits, depth three is already universal, right? So it's already uh, hard to uh, simulate. You cannot simulate in general. So we could do that even on a laptop, okay? Using now some approximate tensor network contraction. Uh, I'll tell you the next slide what is the contraction. Uh, but I, I wanna mention actually, maybe just very briefly, this is related to what Ehud was saying on, 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 the, on, on the first day. He told you this very nice uh, toy model that people like to study now using random circuits, like a one-dimensional random circuits where you weekly measure each of the qubits, right? And then he mentioned there is a phase transition if you measure them weekly enough, uh, then it's like volume scaling of entanglement, right? But if you measure them not that weekly, then at some point you go to some area law phase, right? And the amount of entanglement stays constant. And we're exploring this. So this probably one dimension gets mapped in two dimension actually to the depth of the circuit. So we, we, we think now that there is a phase transition, so, and we don't know what it is yet, we have to do better numerics because we don't have 
such a good analytical understanding, but maybe it's around five for, for random circuits. And, and, and before five is actually, we think, polynomial time to solve this. It scales polynomially in N. And after five, there is some phase transition, and then we start growing much faster in this, once you map the problem to this measure circuit. And then, you know, at the moment, it appears that this benchmark that I told you before is correct, okay? Uh, but why I mention this then? Well, because there's a take home message, right? We must be really careful with future novel class algorithms, right, when you claim supremacy. So supremacy is when it's achieved, right? Uh, is indeed correct because all these benchmarks, they were very well done and carefully done. But you know, someone we might come up with a better simulation method, right? And, and then that's it. So uh, let me just tell you how we do it. It's, it's tensor network too. So we have this square root of by square root n lattice. And then we have a constant depth circuit D, right? Like depth three or five. And then, you know, we want to we wanna compute some probability distribution. We want to sample, we want to estimate some transition probability, right? How we do? First, we just compute, you know, uh, the first row, we compute um, the, like, we, we compute what would be the probability of measuring a particular bit stream right in the first row, okay? So for example, suppose you want to compute the probability of measuring zero everywhere. So then we compute the probability of measuring zero in the first row. And this we can do efficiently because it's, it's like constant depth. So, uh, you know, we can undo all the gates apart from some light cone on the first row, which grows, right, exponential uh, linear in the depth, right? So the first thing we can do efficiently. But now we go to the second row, and now we already have to post select on the first row being all zero, right? But now post select on the first row being all zero means that we can undo again some of the gates, but, you know, uh, now um, this post selection here might introduce some entanglement in this direction, right? We, we undo all the, all the other ones. We have a, a essentially a one-dimensional problem, but this might have more entanglement now, right? Because we measure this row. And then we keep measuring, and then actually, in, in the worst case, the more we measure, the more we build entanglement in this direction, and at some point, there is you know, a linear amount of entanglement in this direction, and it's just very costly to do the simulation, right? Uh, but actually, depending on the depth, what we see is that entanglement never builds up. You know, it's like if the depth is three or if the depth is four, which we could study, then this stays like it's an area law phase, really. The amount of entanglement in each one of these rows always stays bounded, and you can do it. So, right. So we observe it numerically, and then uh, we can actually map this cost to some statistical mechanical problem. Uh, and then we can show that it's in the area law phase if it's in the other phase of the statmec problem. And we can show that it's volume if it's in the, sorry, so it's, it's area law if it's in the other phase, and it's volume scaling if it's in the other phase. Uh, and then we cannot really have a proof of which phase it is, but it's like, you know, it's known, and it's, it can do numerics on the statmec problems to, uh, to understand. It is, it is pretty similar, it's slightly different, but it's similar, yes. 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 Yeah. So right. Good question. So Dorit is saying, okay. So now, if you have this better method, doesn't this challenge this early benchmarks, right? And uh, so I, I think challenge is one way, and and we should be careful when we say that random circuits are always the hardest to simulate, right? So. For depth three and depth four, they are not, right? This is what we learned. But it was also interesting that we, we really understand that there is a phase transition in the depth here, and when the depth is sufficiently big, and we don't know for sure, but it's around five, you know, what we're seeing, uh, then actually it goes to this regime where indeed they seem to be much harder, right? This is like volume scaling regime, where this, all these benchmarks would apply there. So, so maybe this is also evidence that it's the right one, right? Because the depth that is used in these future experiments, right, that people want to do is like 20 or something like this. Yeah, we do, you, you can do empirically just by running the method and, and, and seeing how much entanglement there is in this MPS that you, you get along the way. Or you can go to the StatMec picture and analyze the phase transition there, right? Using Monte Carlo or, or whatever method you can do. And, you know, we have to do more carefully, but we are getting something around five, I think. So, so you know, it's, it's pretty low depth and they are, right, they'll be at 20 or something, so. So it's still the safe side, right? But it's just, it, this was, uh, okay. So how much time I have? Um, right. So you know, I, I, the the goal was to talk about supremacy for 
the first lecture, they talk about these other potential applications that we might try, but I think I will not talk about them and just talk about supremacy. But now I, I want to talk about a different aspect of, of the supremacy research, which is interesting, which connects with uh, Dorit's lectures, right, and, and with uh, Stevens too, uh, which is that actually, um, you know, I already talk about, not too much, but Pedro we talk about whether it's, you know, what is the main thing of this is just is a, is a, it's a really hard experiment to do, right? And when you can do it, it's, it's, it's really impressive, right? It's a, it's a great achievement in experimental physics, number one, right? But then, you know, you see that there is a, uh, is a, is a very interesting problem in high-performance computing too, right? So you really want to push the state-of-the-art in computing in the best way possible in simulating these this, this circuits, right? Uh, and that's useful and, and that's interesting research. Uh, but actually, the, the origins of supremacy come from complexity theory, people who first thought about this idea of supremacy is purely complexity theory. And, and this problem is also very rich from the complexity theoretical uh, point of view. And this is what I want to discuss in a few slides. Okay, I just want to tell you what we know at the moment about uh, complexity theory, uh, 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 about the complexity theoretical base of the supremacy experiments. And there's some gaps, as right everywhere, uh, but you know, we, we, it, it, is, it will be a, an important component of this, right? It's really nice how like these three different fields, high performance computing, experimental physics, and quantum complex theory are coming together. And usually they cannot really talk to each other, right? But here they can uh, in a very nice way, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, we wanna back up these high performance computing estimates, right? Uh, on the cost of simulation. And we wanna de-risk from future algorithm improvements, right? Because I just show you that in some case, which is not relevant for the future supremacy experiments, we can actually get better versions, right? Uh, so how we can do that? Well, you know, there is a whole theory devoted to that, right? Just to make sure that, or to give strong arguments why we cannot have better algorithms for some particular problem. This is complexity theory, right? Uh, so you wanna use complexity theory to give arguments why the task that we wanna solve classically is actually indeed hard, and you cannot do it, okay? So this is not, uh, this actually uh, was the foundation of all this work on quantum supremacy. So this approach goes back to this foundation work on supremacy proposals, which was first done in Boston sampling by Arison Akipov, and on this instantaneous quantum computing uh, uh, paradigm, in the paper by Bremen, Joseph, and Shefford. They did exactly that, they used complexity theory to give some argument why it would be hard to sample from the distribution of these experiments, right, uh, classically. Uh, and even with noise, but then with noise, actually, they, you know, uh, there are some, some issues that I don't want to get into it. But the motivation for just thinking about supremacy came from right, these this considerations. Good, but these are for different models. It's not about random circuits, and I don't want to explain what they are, and I don't want to explain the results. What uh, is one of the results which is directly applicable to, to this supremacy? Well, like there is a lot, you know, uh, that tries to get closer to, to what people might eventually implement in the lab. is a result by Bullens from 2017. This is an informal definition, you see why. Uh, uh, so what it says is that random circuits, they cannot be sampled efficiently, uh, and efficiently means in polynomial time in, in N and in the depth, uh, unless something bad happens with complexity classes. Okay, so complexity theory, right, uh, Dori showed you the picture. There is all these nice complexity classes, right? We wanna classify them, understand the relation between them. Uh, there is something called polynomial hierarchy that I don't want to explain what it is. Uh, but uh, what these results show is that if we could sample efficiently from this, even from random circuits, and the nice thing about this paper is that they could uh, you know, uh, take care of this random uh, right, uh, feature that is important for us. Even if they could solve this problem, sample efficiently for like, you know, most random circuits, uh, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse to the third level. Um, maybe you never heard what it is, but this is just something that is considered extremely unlikely uh, by people that study uh, complexity theory, right? So there is like a, a math assumption, which is the polynomial hierarchy doesn't collapse. We can, I could explain what it is, but I don't want it because I will give you actually a more concrete version in the next slide of some assumption. And then these people showed it that assuming this assumption, right, in complexity theory, then random circuits, they cannot, there is no like efficient algorithm for sampling them. Okay, yes. This is without, yeah. Okay, so what are the, the challenge, the drawbacks of this? Uh, one is what Nate said, right? So this is only with no noise whatsoever. This near future experiments, right? They have, they will operate 
not only with error, but actually with some kind of low global fidelity. It's still impressive, right? Because it's like a lot of qubits and, 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 and high depth, but very far away from like epsilon one, right? And another challenge of this is asymptotic statement, right? So uh, it's not clear what it implies for a fixed number of qubits, right? So, uh, so let me show you one result. So here again, let me show you how we can address one of these questions. Uh, and show you a result that you can prove if you assume this white noise model. Okay, so um, so let's introduce noise now, but only noise assuming that what you what you can sample is uh, a noise distribution, but the noise is white noise. Then you can prove the following. So you can show that if there is a classical algorithm that runs in time t for sampling from this noisy uh, distribution. Okay where we probably f you have the ideal distribution, probably one minus f you have max in the mix. Then for every integer that you choose L, uh, there exists uh, AM protocol, and I tell you what it is, uh, whose verification times run in time L times C, that for any lambda that you, you want decides, you know, the transition probability is bigger than this number or is smaller than this number. And in other words, uh, allows you to estimate this transition probability to some small error. So there is, a lot of parameters. So what is AM? So Dorit explaining what is NP, right, in the end of her class. Uh, so NP, what it is, you have a verifier, you have a prover. Uh, uh, the prover is all powerful, but you cannot trust him. And the verifier would like the help of the prover to see if, you know, to solve a problem, to decide if a problem is, if an instance of a problem is yes or no. So what is the instance of the problem? You're given a circuit, and you're going to decide if the transition probability is bigger than this number or is smaller than this number. It's a promise problem. Uh, so um, in, in NP, what can happen? The, the prover can send you a bunch of bit strings, which can help you decide which is the case. So we don't know how to do that in NP. What is, what is AM? AM is a version of NP. It's slightly more complicated, but almost the same thing. So in AM, uh, the verifier, uh, the person which is, you know, uh, which is not all powerful, first choose some random bits, sends this to the prover, then the prover uses these random bits to decide which message to send to the verifier. This message is sent, and then the verifier does some computation with this message and decides if it's yes or no. Okay? And then it's the same thing as Dorit was explaining. If actually the answer is yes, there should be a proof that uh, the prover can send to you, which convinces you probably it's bigger than two thirds. If the, the instance is no, then there should be no proof that can convince you, right? So you don't have to trust the proof. And what is AM with this running time L times T? Means that there is an AM protocol, and, and the time it takes for the verifier to certify, right, to compute if it's yes or no, is, is this, is L times T, okay? Um, okay, so there's a, a lot of parameters here, right? Let me help you to simplify it. So let's set first L, is we can set whatever we want, 10 over F. So 10 over fidelis. Uh, now, for a random circuit, because of Potter Thomas, with very high probability, you know, this transition probability is bigger than 2 to the minus n over 5, right? So this is something you can compute. So if you put these numbers here, right? So, you know, this L, um, this would be a small number, right? So this would be um, like uh, 1 plus 5 f. f is a small number, so this is a small number. Again, this is small constants. Uh, then this L can, one of F cancels this F, right? So he, this is you know, something of order like two to the minus N, right? So this means with this choice of numbers that you have an AM protocol whose verification time is L times T, or in, the, in other words, T over F, which can estimate the transition probability to this accuracy, plus minus two to the minus N roughly. What is the time it takes? So what is the time of the verification? The time is 10 T over F, okay? Uh, now, this is not really the time for you to solve. You need the help from an all-powerful Merlin that you don't trust. But the point is that this transition probability, right, this is like some kind of, um, we don't think a, a Merlin can help at all, right? So this is, this is like, in the worst case, it's like sharp hard problem, which is way much harder than AM. So we also have this belief, which we're going to use here, that this AM, we don't know how it can really help you, right? So what this is saying is that, you know, uh, if you can sample, from the noisy distribution, morally, you can also compute the transition probability you know, of the ideal circuits uh, in a time which is the time that it takes t to compute, to, to sample from the noisy distribution divided by the fidelity, right? 
so what this, so in a sense, right, there's a, you know, a lot of caveats, the error model, you have this AM, uh, you have this Merlin help, but in a sense, this is a way, using complexity theory, to justify that this linear decrease in fidelity of the classical simulation cost that I mentioned to you before is like tight, right? You cannot improve it, okay? So we see that we have a method that increases linearly, right, I told you, and this is an argument why, you know, we should not be able to improve it, okay? So that's one, that's how complex theory can help you um, get, get, you know, uh, having uh, a justification for the noisy sampling being hard as well. That's one thing. But it still leaves open, right, another issue. Great, so now uh, we know that sampling from the noise distribution is, you know, uh, is this fact is one of F uh, easier than computing this transition probability. But how hard it is to compute this transition probability for a random circuits with this error, right? Uh, and in particular, we're not just interested in, in, in some asymptotic result. We like to know a finite size result, right? Uh, some people analyze that, and that's the best result that is known. It's this pretty interesting paper by Juan Newman Zegedi. So again, right, ev as everything in complex theory, you need some assumption, right? So they use an assumption, it's called strong exponential type hypothesis. It's a strong assumption, but you know, it, you can say, which says that SATs, you no, know, you have three SATs that are introduced, right? You have like, no, each, each clause involves three variables. You can have four SATs, each clause involves four, four variables, and so on. What the conjecture is that K SAT, when K grows, uh, on n variables, this really takes exponential time in n, okay? That's uh, really you have to go over all possible configurations. Uh, for free SAT, you can do something better. For four SAT, you can do something better, but when you grow, it starts approaching two to the n. And we're going to assume this. Then assuming this conjecture, uh, that is kind of, you know, people use this a lot in classic computer science, right? Even though uh, some people might have doubts, but there is no algorithms that do better. Then assuming this conjecture, what this guy shows is that there is a circuit, not a random circuit, but a particular circuit running on depth a bit, right, like n to 5 over 2. So that's kind of also in a different ballpark from the depth that we have in, the exper in, we have in this future experiment, which requires exponential time. The small O of 1 is really something that goes to 0, right, when, when n grows. Uh, so really it takes time 2 to the n to estimate this transition probability exactly to the accuracy that we, we care about before, okay? Uh, so, and, and, it's, and Dowsell and, and others also uh, study this. This is called like fine-grained complexity, and this is like using fine-grained complexity to really get concrete lower bounds on the time, which is what matters, right, because in the experiment we have finite numbers. So what is the drawback of that? So this almost gives kind of, you know, a complete picture of, of the hardness under at least this assumption on the error. So there, but there is some drawbacks. So first, the, the depth of this construction by these guys uh, is n to the 5 over 2. The depth that we are at is really more like square root of n, right? So it, the depth will be much bigger than what we can potentially uh, do and verify in, in this uh, future exper experiments. Uh, and also, we don't really know how to prove a similar result for random circuits, okay? So there's some progress, a very recent paper, but it doesn't achieve that. Uh, so that's actually, actually an interesting open question. Can we prove exactly the same results, but for random circuits? And then this would also give, uh, at least you know, under the, sum the error assumption, uh, a nice theoretic complexity uh, justification for, for the hardness of, the of what the supremacy is doing. So uh, yes, so, so this is a family of circuits, like given a, a SAT instance, they build a circuit which encodes the SAT instance, right? And then they can show that if you could, you know, uh, compute this, you could solve the SAT instance. If you could compute this, the circuit depends on the SAT instance, and if you compute this transition probability with this error, you could solve the SAT instance. So that's kind of... That's right. Yeah, uh, so, sorry, say again. No, it's not. It's, uh, no, in their construction, it's very special circuits in, in, in this space of n to the five over two, yeah. Um, so indeed, you need some kind of uh, worst case to average case reduction here, which this uh, the Boland and others could do, but you have to preserve this kind of accuracy, like two to the minus n. If you use their method, you can only get here like two to the minus poly n for a very big polynomial. So that's a challenge. Okay, so um, good. Um, so this is what I want to tell you about supremacy. Let, let me just summarize wh why I think this is, this is nice. Uh, well, first, because it right, seems on the cusp of being achieved, right? So if you want to check Twitter, maybe you find something there. Uh, so 
I, I think it's really a nice mashup of experimental quantum computing, high performance computing, and quantum complexity, right? And I really think it's the first time that we have this. And I hope this becomes the norm now, right? Uh, so I think th this, is, this is nice. I think this really should be the example for the kind of future work that hopefully we have in, in this NISC era that we are potentially entering, right? So I think this will be exactly the case, and this will be the, you know, the point of the second half of my talk, which I won't have time, but it, it was exactly about that, right? So um, you have a problem, you want to solve the quantum computer, you have to do a, you'll be most likely a heuristic, then you have to do a lot of HPC work to benchmark how hard you can do this classically, right? And then you can run on the quantum computer and understand the noise and see if it's working. This is the experimental, right, quantum computing parts. And then, of course, you'd like to have some understanding, right, so on, on really if your HPC benchmark is correct and quantum complex can help there, right? So these people should be talking more and more with each other, right, like quantum complexity theories and uh, people working on theoretical size of quantum information, people doing HPC and people doing experiments, right? Um, so this is a milestone for, for quantum computing development, I think. So it opens the door for these possibilities of, of NISC applications, right? So of NISC useful applications, right? So which is very high bar. Uh, by no means is given that we'll find it. Maybe we need like, you know, thousands of qubits or maybe tens of thousands of qubits. Or maybe only we want, once we have error correct computers, we will have it. We don't know yet. But at least it opens the possibility, right? Before supremacy, it was simply not possible. And uh, going back, right? So I think this is the first serious experimental challenge of this strong church firing thesis that uh, Doritz explained, right? So, so it's the first time that we see an experiment, a uh, model of a computation, which seems to be different from you know, the computation that we can do on our laptops, right? Uh, still very limited, but that's cool, right? So, uh, and hopefully we'll get better and better demonstrations of that with time. Uh, so that's it, thanks. Yes. No, so I, I, I no, I, I mean, uh, so, so the important property is that the sh operator should be rank of your unitary is four. Uh, ISOP has it, CZ doesn't. If you take uh, the, 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 the set of two qubit gates which do not have Schmidt rank four is a measure zero set. So almost every unitary, right, like, so has it. If you pick one at random, you have it, for sure, right? But even, it's, it's even stronger. It's a measure zero set, this exceptional set. Well, you know, people tried the best method they could, right? And Yeah, and, and there is this, this complex thing, right? So, okay, so if you have, um, if it was not random, but a, a carefully chosen circuit, right, then we know that probably, you know, this exponential time might be the right thing, this exponential scaling, right? Um, we know that, okay, there is also the noise model, but we know that this linear decrease in fidelity seems to be the right thing, right? So there is some evidence, right? But not the complete picture, you're right. But we know we have some evidence for, um, for the linear decrease in fidelity, right? No, I mean, um, no, we don't, yeah, but, but suppose, so m let, me, let me put together these two results, but. Well, but, um, in a sense, there is this Boland result shows that, right? That you can do this big overhead. Yeah, the overhead is bad. Yeah, but but that's why this. Uh, so so okay. So see if you agree with that. Right, but but th but th that's why the error, right? Um, if um, this. This white noise error seems to be pretty good, right? And then assuming it, then you have this linear, right? Then the error will take care of it, right? But this is what I showed, this result I showed you before, right? So maybe you're not happy with the error model, that's true, but I think the way to go is. 
Yeah, right. Then, then, then I show you this result, right, which uh, shows that then you, oh, the best thing you can have is a linear decrease in fidelity, right? In, the compl in going from the noise assembly. Yeah. This. Right, so, so this, this is saying that there is an AM protocol verification running in, in 10 C over F time, which can compute this transition probability if you can sample in time C from the noisy experiments. Right. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs>